Greetings, YouTube. It's me, Joe, and I'm back with another reaction. Oh. What? I haven't even fully done my intro yet, and you're already dolling me the reformers? Oh, hi, YouTube. It's me, Joe. I'm back with another reaction. And oh. Oh, yep. Here we go. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Okay, uh, we'll just accept this as the punches roll. Unfortunately, I can't drink today, so fuck. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, anyway, what's up, YouTube? It's me, Joe, and you know the rest. And there's Koa. Everyone, you all love him. And, uh, yeah, we're doing Laser Pig because, um... Yeah, he decided to upload a new video. Yay me! Why is his content so enjoyable? And why the f oh? I'm not even in the mood for a Dr. Pepper. Actually, you know what? Fuck it, I will. Of course, the reformers are here. Of course, the reformers. There, Koa. You know what, Koa? Look cute. Look cute. Everyone, you're here for him. Look at him. He's cute. Enjoy him. I will be back. Oh my god. I can't Of course the reformers are here, they have to ruin my fucking day. <sighs> well, like, the reformers are involved in this, so yeah. Excuse me, the camera's a little fucky-wucky. <sighs> fucking reformers. So yeah, apparently we're talking about stealth. Oh boy. But before we watch this video, make sure you like and subscribe, turn on notifications, follow me on all my social media down below in the description, and if you want to keep supporting this channel and giving that adorable puppy dog over there cookies, please go join my YouTube membership. You get cool little nifty things, just ask tribal. Anyway, before another thing before we get started, I know some people have said that I kind of don't do the whole like pausing and shit properly or whatever I do in this video. I don't pause or at the right times or this or that. I'm just, I'm an amateur. I'm doing this as a genuine reaction. So I apologize if some of the stuff I do irks you. If you want to watch his video, it's on his channel. It's not that hard to find. Just look for the pig. All right. Uh, to my, to my, to my future crippling, uh, sugar addiction. All right, let's see what we got here. Let's get... Ugh. Let's get this video started in three, two, one, and... I'm probably the top 40. Maybe I'm the 39th. Why, hello. I'm sophisticated sophistication man. After a hard day's work horse riding around my fabulous estate and shooting peasants with my enormous gun, I feel like I need a delightfully refreshing beverage to pack me up for an evening at the Phillies and Beef Club. And we all know what happens there. <laughs> But as a sophisticated man, I won't just trick anything. Oh no. So when I crack open my delightful waifu gamer subs chalice and admire that ample bosom and take that fast delightful sip of anime girl thigh, I feel myself reach the highest 
cakes God of sophistication. Truly, this is the time to but be alive. Is part of the course. Now, if you adorably sophisticated peasantry watching this musing wish to reach levels of sophistication, Person equal to my own. Oh, One God. only need visit gamersubs.gg where using the code Lazier. One can get 10% off every order, not just your first one. The hell kind of voice am I doing now? And for the that first exactly 20 what I'm hours of Princess Video Girls Live, you can enjoy free samples and free shipping with the first 250 peasantry receiving a sticky pack. Get fucking hype, boy! Sticker pack for free. You love stickers. We all love stickers. It's the best thing ever. Stickers, gamer subs, coke, laser, stickers, free stickers. What are we fucking? Well, again, stickers, boob cup. You're denying it, but you want the boob cup, coke, laser, gamer subs, dot gg, zero sugar, cop free, best oh, and probably healthiest way to wean yourself off an energy drink addiction. Stickers get free ten percent off purchases. Coke laser. The ad is now over. Gamer Thank subs God. gave me a year long contract. The objective is to get them to cancel it. You have been warned. I am laser pig. By the funny wake up powder. Here's the video. Hello, I'm Laser Pig, self-proclaimed military expert and all-round bit of an idiot. I've always been obsessed with history, even from an early age where history books and DVDs were a common gift on Christmas and birthdays, yep. which honestly I much preferred over gift boxes of deodorant and eau de toilette, you know, yeah, me whatever too. the fuck that is. You may have shared Pretty a similar big. experience. I mean, do people still buy DVDs? I don't, I don't know, I'm not down with the kids, I have no idea what they do. And whatever they do scares me. Yes. But since my discovery of the reformers in the fight to play Mafia back in 2013, my subject of interest moved away from the Second World War and big armor boxes with guns in them, fascinating though they are. Yes. And instead, I spent many a night, pot of coffee in one hand, bottle of wine in the other. Alright, more wine than coffee. All right, fine. I had a bottle of wine in both hands, okay? Uh, Point is, I ventured deeper and deeper into this weird-ass rabbit hole of a fairly recent history that so many people just don't seem to know about, despite happening literally just a few years ago. These men, this self-proclaimed fighter playing mafia, lied to the public for years, all to further their careers and financial gain, doing what so many children on the internet do by proclaiming they had some hand in developing some of America's most famed weapons and they got completely away with it. Up until his death, Pierre Spray was still considered the lead designer of the A-10, the F-15, and even the F-16, in spite Bastard. of being involved in none of these projects. Nope. John Boyd claimed he designed the F-15, and yet had almost nothing to do with it. I mean, yes, he was involved in a very early design spec phase, but his ideas were scrapped after the advent of the MiG-31, and the plane that would become the F-15 was completely redesigned from the ground up. Yeah. Colonel J James Burton would always proclaim that the Bradley was a work of Pentagon corruption, in spite of himself being arguably the most corrupt, career-motivated, and money-wasting element of the entire program. Because he was and a Spiney? Bitch. Spiney got an award for his services to the government from the Pogo Foundation, the foundation he helped found. And all he did while still working at the Pentagon was to send over 500 emails to various people over the years, blasting them for their critique of the fighter plane mafia, several of which were sent to the editor of the Air Force magazine, in which he referred to him as intellectual slime, for daring to point out that in Spiney's report where he claimed the defense budget of the United States was five <coughs> times what it had been in Vietnam, shock horror, he had forgotten about inflation. And the one question I have constantly asked myself is why? Why have these men been allowed to get away with this shit for as long as they have? I mean, yes, the Air Force is still to a point obsessed with Boyd, even if it is just his fellow PowerPoint commandos, but surely there were higher-ups around at the time who would have known what he was saying was bullshit, knew he and Spray had absolutely nothing to do with the projects they claimed ownership of. Heck, when Pentagon Wars was published, and even when it was being converted into a film, the generals Burton was talking about were all still alive, and would have known damn fine he was nothing but a career monkey out for blood. So why say nothing? Why let the fighter plane mafia continue their bullshit rampage to the point where any private snafu, disillusioned from the propaganda trip that roped him into serving, genuinely believes the US military and the Pentagon are more corrupt and more self-serving than the fucking Kremlin? 
Now I have a now theory. That's of course, an it's insult. just a theory. It sounds plausible, but ultimately, I have no idea if it's true or not. And considering it's about the US military, it could be just as equally true as it is untrue or anywhere in between. Let me explain. After years of digging through archives, books, declassified reports, emails, and even opinion pieces by those around at the time in search for information about the fighter plane mafia and the true depths of this almost calm they've been running since the 50s, the name of a certain aircraft keeps popping up. Now, this aircraft, the reformers absolutely hate it. For years, they waged an intense war against it remaining in active service, and when it was finally retired, they celebrated it as a victory. You should, of course, know what it is, being as it's one of my favorite planes. Now, I, I know I, I say that a lot. I, I mean, I say that about almost every single plane I ever see. The Vulcan, for example, the Harrier, the MiG-29, the Jet. But one has always stood out. I had a picture of one as a kid. I had models of the damn thing. I even had this big one you could stick little action figures in and this bike came out the side. I don't know why it did that, but it did. I had a weird childhood where I played with dolls, but in my defense, they were action dolls with guns and stabby the things. They were and makeup dolls, you could they put were on, but it was action, action makeup for camouflage, you know, for jungles and swamps and the after party at the ambassadorial reception where you needed to look your best. Otherwise, you, you know, you'd cause a diplomatic scandal and no one wants that. Action Man! going down at three and one roller extreme action man! That plane, of course, was the F-117, the Nighthawk. I'm sorry. Hold up. Hold up. The reformers hated the fucking Nighthawk. Fucking Nighthawk. The plane that arguably, arguably, we could not have made Iraq poss the first Iraq war possible without this plane. The plane that literally kicked the front door open on stealth. I, the reformers, shut. <sighs> <sighs> My absolute favorite aircraft of all time, which you probably should know because it was in the title of the video. Were you thinking it was something else? Can you not read? In spite of only being revealed to the public in 1988, the Nighthawk became a symbol of the 80s and is quite possibly the most iconic of aircraft of all time. There is the nothing in the world that looks quite like it. It is instantly identifiable to even the most brain dead of individuals. Even the ones who lurk on internet forums using the name and profile picture of some 1940s German general arguing that the Challenger 2 cannot possibly be a good tank because the armor isn't sloped. What? Jackass. Could potentially fire up the tattered remains of that one remaining brain cell, and with just a little bit of effort and quite a lot of energy drink, might just be able to identify this as an F-117 before launching into a rant about the heart and hole, which I've already covered. We've Granted, already in a video that makes me sound like I'm recording it at the bottom of a well, because I recorded all of my old videos in a microphone that I stole from a karaoke bar. I was very poor back then. But I'm not covering it again, okay? But what is the F-117? Why is it important? Why do the reformers hate it so much? And what has it got to do with Pierre Spray and my theory? Well, the F-117 is well, a stealth fighter. I mean, we call it a fighter, but it doesn't do the actual fighting that you'd typically expect of a fighter plane. It doesn't, like, fight other fighters. I mean, not really. I mean, some former F-117 pilots have spoken about the plane having strike sidewinders rack. on improvised rails and flying around at night trying to see if they can shoot something down, but, well, no records if they did that or not have ever been released to the public, so if or not that's true, well, your guess is as good as mine. That's so, it doesn't fight other planes. It was never designed to do it. So what does it fight? Well, this plane wow. fights the ground. <laughs> or rather, what's on the ground. Same brain cell, I swear to God. Get up here, Goa. Get, up on the, get back up on your futon. Oh, you see, no. for thousands of years, militaries have typically kept important things that they need on the ground. Mm. Things like barracks and ammo depots, and there's a good reason for this. It's cheap, it's there, and it avoids either having to build a large network of tunnels oh, or mess around outside with- Outside again? Jesus, Koa! <laughs> the puppy always needs to take informs. Thank God that we have a door here now. Now we can make things easier. He has to snap. And when he's done, he'll knock. Okay, so let's also tell him. Let us talk. Let us talk here. So, 
Yes, the F-117, though it does carry a fighter designation, is not a fighter. It's a strike aircraft. It's meant to carry a lot of bombs. It's meant to carry bombs and and hit and land them on... Four Basically, its job is to put warheads on foreheads very, very fucking accurately. Hello? Hello, Sp Hello Spiros. Yes. No, actually, uh, no, it don't go burr. It don't go burr. Yeah. Nighthawk have no gun. Nighthawk have no gun. It is strictly, it strictly has bombs. Big bombs. It's a strike aircraft. Basically, I, if, I, if I remember correctly, the Nighthawk, when the whole build, there was supposed to be a fighter variant. It was all based off of a prototype called, what was it called? Oh, fuck, I can't remember off the top of my head. But, oh, well, yeah, it could carry only two bombs. But those two bombs could be, for the, at the time, some of the most advanced. They were laser guided. They could, it didn't carry the dumb bombs. It didn't like fly over the target like, okay, bomb site, general area, click. No, it's like, I'm going to take a laser designator. I'm going to put it right on someone's forehead. And that bomb is going to hit that forehead at terminal velocity and explode. What if I had one of these? The world would be a lot more peaceful. Oh, it sounds like he's ready. Coming! Cash Master, I hear a dino bay. Let's see if you put that in here. Good boy. <laughs> get your butt up there. You gotta go get up there. You know your spot. You know your spot. So, yes. And, yeah, from the looks of it, if I know, from drawing off of past experience with Pig and the Reformers, I'm going to assume that the reason that the Reformers hated the F-117, gonna go get a drink, buddy? He's gonna go get a drink. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> So, if any, if I can judge any assumption to what happened, the reason the reformers hate the F one of the seventeen is because it's stealthy, it's modern, it doesn't have, it's not made of wooden canvas, it doesn't have a propeller, and it doesn't have machine guns, and there is no Red Baron or Snoopy flying in in it. <sighs> While the dog goes to get water in this nice big bowl that's in the other part of the house. Yeah, what the heck, he needs exercise. Let's get on with it, shall we? With the logistics of balloons, the ground is also where people live and where their stuff is. And if you're the military of a country, your country's people and your country's stuff is typically what you're trying to stop other countries from stealing. So it's pretty good to have your military nearby in case that happens. Now at some point, someone realizes planes are a thing. When you're in a plane, you could fight things that were on the ground, but because you weren't on the ground, and typically everything on the ground is designed to fight things that are also on the ground, it has a kind of hard time getting to you who isn't on the ground. Now this gives you a huge advantage. So a plane has the amazing ability to fly over the ground and not have to deal with anything that was say in the way of, of like a regular army, like walls or trenches or minefields. And in fact, it could fly all the way past all that bullshit and fight things on the ground that typically weren't expecting to have to fight that day. Things like a factory, because a factory is a building that's on the ground. So it can't fight you who is not on the ground, and that, that gives you a huge advantage. Now, we have a word for things like that, which is bomber. So why is this a fighter and not a bomber? Why isn't it the B-117? Well, I looked into it and the official explanation seems to be, nah. No, seriously, really? then our theories, one theory which seems to be the most plausible is they recruited fighter pilots to fly these things because it's a single seater and it flies like a fighter, which bomber pilots wouldn't be used to. And a fighter pilot might get upset if they had to degrade themselves to flying a bomber. Fighter pilots fly fighters. They don't fly bombers. Bombers are big and that slow and don't do all the super believable. cool maneuvers you see in Top Gun. Bombers aren't exciting. Yeah, the fighters, fighters are exciting. Fighters can fight things that fight back so it's far more noble and adventurous, unlike bombers who fight things that don't fight back, like buildings and civilians and 
war crimes and stuff. Jesus. Like, there's a hierarchy in military aviation. It goes fighters, bombers, and then transport. I mean, yeah. okay, there's a bit of an overlap. Like, the pilots of MH6 Littlebirds, for example. Helicopter pilots are somewhat not super respected by the Air Force. Notably because, due to interdepartmental politics, they are mostly run by the Army. Because the Army needed aircraft. And the Air Force decided that everything that was a plane was their jurisdiction. So if the Army needed close air support, they had to call the Air Force, who could turn around and say, no. And the Army thought that was a stupid idea, so they built a flying machine that wasn't a plane. And this turned out to be a really good idea. But if I'm going to be 100% honest with you, having seen a little bird in action, these guys have half an inch of glass protecting their entire body from death. They have a minigun and like a rocket pod or something, and they just find the target and Rover they fly in close to it. I mean, so close. If you were a guy in a trench and then a little bird's coming at you, they get so close you could reach in and punch the pilot. That's how close they get. Yeah, and they come back with no ammo and the biggest smile on their face and just this trail of devastation and death behind them. An inch of glass protecting their balls from a bullet. I would not want to fuck with any of these guys. Anyway, I'm right. I swear to God, I've met Little Bird Pilots. I've seen these guys, and these guys are psychopaths. I swear to God. Men, women, it doesn't matter. These fuckers are psychos. And they're ap they're, they'll just be like, we're carrying in the guys, and then we're going to go fuck shit up. And they do it with the biggest fucking grin. <laughs> the biggest fucking shit eating grin. The grin of, I am going to commit mass genocide on the enemy. It's absolutely insane. And then they will do these crazy... I mean, the, the mindset of these guys think early 2000s skateboarders. I'm absolutely serious. They're the absolute psychos of the military. They'll look at something like, Hey, bro. Hey, bro. I, watch this. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna come on these guys. They're gonna shoot at me. I'm gonna come up, do a full loop, come into, and then come straight down, lay off my mini guns, and then fly off. Oh no, they don't listen to Fly to the Valkyries. No sensor. I just saw. I just saw. They don't do Fly to the Valkyries. They, like I said, early 2000s skateboarders. These fuckers are listening to metal. These fuckers are listening to metal. <laughs> I'm talking like lit, like oh my god, these guys are psychos and I love them. I love them. Oh, continuing on, rambling. So the F-117 is not a fighter, it's a bomber. It's labelled as a fighter, but it doesn't do what fighters do. It do what bombers do. So what does the stealth part mean? Well, stealth, in lieu of any nonsensical, overly detailed explanation as given by various fancy dictionaries and websites, is the art of not being seen. If you can't be seen, the enemy can't shoot at you. This is why the F-117 is black and flies at night. Night is dark. You can't see very well in the dark, especially if what you're looking for is also dark. Only the superior American mind could think of such things. Okay, it's more than that. It's not stealthy because they painted it black. Okay, look, this is going to take some time to explain, because to understand why stealth, you need to understand why is stealth important. Since the 1950s, the development of aircraft focused largely around the deployment of nuclear bombs, dropped yes. from very long-range bombers, which were expected to operate well outside the range of surface weapons, which at the point were largely big guns that could put objects on the ground into the air, where planes are, and planes don't typically like that. But those guns had maximum ranges of maybe 25,000 feet. A modern bomber could fly at 40,000 feet and above, meaning these guns were pretty much useless. If you wanted to hit something that high up with a gun, you'd need a really, really big gun, like an impractically sized gun, and then bombers could just fly higher. So what was the point? Everything was built around the logic that bombers were king. The bomber would always get through no matter what. This led to such wonderful trains of thought, mostly from certain members of the US Air Force, that the other divisions of the US military, mostly the army, were completely unnecessary, as the Air Force could bomb any threat into total submission. Therefore, the US Army doesn't need that huge budget. Wouldn't it be great if the Air Force had instead? Think of what we could build. This ideology came to a crashing halt when, in 1960, the Soviets shot down a U-2 spy plane that had been flying at an altitude of 70,000 feet, presumed to be well above the altitude that Soviet fighters could fly at. And well, technically, it was. Yeah. The U-2 was not shot down by a fighter. It had been shot down by a surface-to-air system, a missile. And like many things in the US military, 
This caused an argument. In fairness, the writing had been on the wall for quite some time that something like this would happen. Joint war games with the Brits had found the English Electric Lightning could not only easily intercept U-2's biplanes, but even exceed them in flight ceiling when pushed. It was blatantly obvious that the days of nuclear bombers were numbered, but a close-knit group within the ranks of the Air Force, dubbed the Bomber Mafia, ignored the signs. After the U-2 incident, the Air Force would separate it. What? You were just outside! What's up? Come here! Come here. Come here. Come here. What's going on? Come here. What's up? What? Are you jealous? Are you not getting your limelight? Are you not getting your love? Are the fans not giving you the love? They're, they've been talking about you constantly. Why? Is it my? Is it because they can't pet you? Is that it? They can just compliment you? My goodness. Yes, yes. You want to thank them for giving you treats by joining the YouTube membership, don't you? <sighs> okay. <laughs> oh, I cry. <laughs> anyway, but now let's talk about some. Now let's talk about something about these heavy bombers. Yes, back in the 1950s, and uh, it was mainly that them saying, "Oh, well, we don't have to get involved." In Literally, there was a mindset in the Air Force in the early days of the Air Force after a transition from the Air Corps which was a part of the army. They don't make one in his size. And plus, it's a freeze warning out there, so it's cold as fuck. So I'm not putting anything... No. Anyway. So basically, they look... They, so basically, in the 1950s, the Air Force is like, well, we don't need to get involved in foreign wars anywhere. We don't want to send the army over there. We can just bomb them from our own continent, have the ocean protect us, as well as all the Europeans. And of course, everybody, and I do mean everybody, the Army, Marines, the Navy, all of the American people, all of the Europeans, looked at the Air Force and went, are you fucking high? Though, to be honest, they were probably sniffing low oxygen up there, so more than likely, yeah. So, yeah. White, you think you're joking, but um, Ten Bucks says there was a project about that during World War II. But yeah, uh, they thought they oh we can just fly high because the Soviets are so backwater and so stupid they can't make anything. Uh, where did they get those missiles? Why are they climbing to such a high altitude? Why are they tracking our U two? Why is our U two falling? Why is the pilot ejected? Oh god, that's a wing. Oh god, that's the engine. Oh oh god, oh god, oh god, oh fuck. A little help? <laughs> that was the Air Force in a nutshell in the 50s. Oh my god. Into two separate camps. One side believed that fighter bombers would be the future of the Air Force, and I those agree. who believed in the separation of bombers and fighters, and that fighters should remain a dedicated air superiority role. Over the years, those two camps would slowly start to dominate thinking within the Pentagon, and oddly enough, both were equally justified. The U-2 incident had caused major concerns within the minds of the first group. They believed air superiority could never be achieved unless ground-based anti-air systems could also be taken out, without the need of large bombers. But the second group believed that the inclusion of equipment required to facilitate a ground attack role would compromise the fighter's ability to, well, fight. Heavy equipment on a plane could compromise speed and maneuverability, and in the dogfight, if you couldn't maneuver, if you couldn't get your speed up, you were dead. And in fairness, they had a point. This was the 1960s. Ground attack meant heavy rocket pods and bombs and cannons. Not really something you want on a fighter plane. Now, the two sides would eventually agree to compromise, and the resulting aircraft would be the F-15. A topic for another video, because, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll, we need we'll it, get to that. We need But while it. all this was going on, there was a problem about what to do with all these bombers. In the USSR, development had began to shift away from bombers, and more towards long-range ballistic missiles. Yes. And the US was looking to do the same, and this kind of had a knock-on effect. Most notably, a large supercarrier called the United States oh class, God. designed to carry and launch nuclear-armed bombers, was cancelled. This led to a revolt within the Naval Admiralty and cemented the feud between the Navy and the Air Force, because though the Navy's oh. bomber fleet was axed, the Air Force's was not. The bomber mafia were still too strong an influence within the walls of the Pentagon. 
and they were not going to accept the decommissioning of the nuclear bomber fleet, even though now it was theoretically useless. But even then, their influence was dwindling. The ideology of the bomber will always get through was now being seriously questioned, and with the bomber mafia really- I'm sorry, I just have to say this, I didn't have to fucking say this, that whole idea of the, the bomber will get through. Yeah, tell that to the B-17 crews that flew over Europe during World War II. They're like, oh yeah, the bomber, yeah, a bomber gets through, but it comes back heavily damaged, and that's if it's lucky. If it ain't so lucky, it goes, it goes plum plummeting down to Earth in a fucking blaze of fire. The crew will hopefully jump out, and hopefully their parachutes open, and if they're even lucky... If they are lucky, the the enemy will just happily like take them prisoner and throw them in a nice warm P POW camp. If they're lucky. Ugh. I mean, there is that line in the Air Force anthem. We go up in fame, we go down in flames. Old 666 is a whole nother can of worms of craziness and madness. Let's not, let's not bring up old 666. Te plus, technically, it was a reconnaissance piece of a team. Anyway, but yeah. The whole, the bomber will get through is basically the, it's basically the equivalent of the World War One thinking of, oh, let's just send wave after wave of peasants at the enemy machine guns. A couple of them will get through. The same philosophy of, they can't stop us all. The, ga the, the minigun begs to differ and is willing to test that. Being the roost for so long, sub-factions within the Air Force, sensing weakness, were starting to circle like sharks. In order to stay on top, the Bomber Mafia needed to keep the idea of long-range bombers relevant, and the suggestion on how to tackle this problem came from a very unexpected place. Oh, where? Looking for a cheaper solution than expensive long-range missile systems, Britain had tested the idea of flying bombers at low altitudes. Now, only one of their bombers could actually do this, the Vulcan. The other two bombers in the V-Fleet were built for high-altitude maneuvers, <coughs> and operating for too long at low altitude caused serious fatigue on the hull. Yes. But the Vulcan was different. It was able to keep low, and its design meant it was somewhat difficult to keep track of on older radar systems. The Brits began training Vulcan crews on how to navigate at low altitude. It was re-equipped with stronger wings, terrain-following radar, and larger air intakes, and though it had never been designed for such a role and many higher-ups in the British military doubted it would have ever worked, during trials and exercises, the low-altitude Vulcan proved fairly successful. The Bomber Mafia took note of this. They could develop a new bomber that was capable of low-altitude attacks, and the project would be saved. Now this is where things start to get weird. Oh. The Navy's rebellion had been largely successful. While they didn't end up with the United States bomber carrier design, they did end up with the Forrestal, probably the most iconic of America's carriers, with the last one finally being decommissioned in 1998. But the Navy the wanted carriers. their own nuclear bomber. This was entirely a political move to remain competitive when it came to funding, so not wanting another rebellion on their hands, Congress agreed, and the Navy ended up with the A3D Sky Warrior. Well, originally they had the AG Savage, which wins points for style, but was so heavy and cumbersome that it couldn't fit onto most carriers, yeah. everyone hated it, and it was found that if it did drop an A-bomb, the plane wasn't fast enough to outrun the blast. Nope. So it was basically a suicide mission, which incidentally most people are not particularly fond of. So yeah. the Sky Warrior became the way forward. Now, the Air Force saw this, got jealous, and wanted their own, so they asked for a ground-based variant of the Sky Warrior. And in theory, this would have been an easy conversion. Add in ejector seats, take off the hooks, and remove the reinforced struts needed for carrier landings. But because the Air Force was the Air Force and the Navy wouldn't share, this conversion took far longer and was far more expensive than it oh. should have been. And though visually similar, the resulting B-66 destroyer was completely different in almost every respect. But then, as is quite typical of the time period, 
the Soviets did a thing. The thing in question was the Tu-16, a long-range twin-engine jet bomber. Now, the Navy started to become a little bit concerned by the Tu-16. It believed that these bombers were fast, in fact so fast, by the time the radar of a ship had detected them, their interceptors wouldn't have enough time to, well, intercept them. And it was very possible that if the Soviets launched these nuclear-armed bombers against a carrier fleet, then there was little the fleet could actually do to stop them. They needed a solution. The result for the Navy was the F-16 Missileer. Now again, this was not a fighter. It was not designed to dogfight or attack other fighters. It was built to fight bombers. Thus, it was built to fly high, be slow, but importantly, stick around for a long time in the same area and wait for the bombers to come to them, and then shoot them down with a very not Awful idea, a long-range radar-guided missile. Now, this pisses a lot of people off, mostly the Air Force, since intercepting bombers is supposed to be their job, and they don't have a shiny new missile plane to do it, so they want their own one. But the Missileer doesn't have a gun, so when it runs out of missiles, it has no choice but to go home to a carrier that's about to be nuked. This defies convention. Since missiles are new, many see them as a bit of an expensive fat, an unreliable wonder weapon. And again, this is the 1960s, they were kinda right. In order to get a lock on with its missiles, the missileer had to get within visual range of the target, and then drop out of visual range before firing to give the missile enough time to activate. Now this wasn't technically a fault of the system. The missileer could lock on and fire at things it couldn't see. It was a fault of doctrine. Beyond visual range combat wasn't really a thing. And since radars of the time couldn't really identify exactly what it was looking at, yes. there was a slight chance the fast, large flying jet bomber you were looking at was actually one of those new jet airliners that were becoming all the rage. Mm. So the pilot had to visually identify the target before firing. But a lot of people, most notably the reformers who like to smugly state this fact at any presented opportunity, tend to forget about that bit. Now, as per usual, this caused something of an argument. And into that argument steps one Robert McNamara. Oh, Mac! Oh, McNamara. Oh, this slimy little worm. Oh. Oh. If anyone knows anything about Robert Magnamaria, there is there you say it in hushed tones and under your breath. You speak his name in hushed, hated whispers, cause the man was a fucking ma maniac. Oh God, McNamara, Kennedy, why? McNamara is a character that deserves a video all in his own. Oh -oh! There are better people working on that, so I'll skip the majority of the politics that surround him. McNamara was a bit of a maverick in that he did what he wanted, and he liked to piss off the top brass as much as physically possible. Uh, because of this, uh, most of the good he did never received due credit, and instead he went down he in history go. as the stupid person you giggle at in your podcast when you're talking about Vietnam. Needless to say, talking to almost any Air Force veteran about him will encourage wrath. But regardless of what you think of him, McNamara stepped into position to find three branches of the same military all fighting each other. They all had their own designations for things, their own way of doing things. No one wanted to share, there was almost no standardization, and everyone thought they could easily win any war if the other two branches would kindly stop hogging all the funding and let them build a Death Star. McNamara looked at the Missileer and found the concept to be needlessly outdated and expensive. I mean, it was basically replacing an early warning radar system with a plane, a plane that needed fuel and had a pilot who would be sat circling for hours until the next plane came along to replace him. It was a huge cost of manpower and resources. But on top of that, the Air Force's own bomber fleet was not exactly up to modern standards. The B-47 Stratojet, though one of the most drop-dead gorgeous aircraft in the world, fight me on that, had the tendency to yes. blow up in mid-air all by itself. And for reasons completely unknown to the Air Force at the time, McNamara decided that this was problematic. What he wanted was a cheaper solution, in the form of a joint aircraft, a single plane that could fulfil the needs of both the Air Force and the Navy, one that was interchangeable and would only require slight modification. Now that in itself was never going to be easy, and most people today just aren't aware of how bad the inter-force rivalry was between the three main branches. Individual generals held a lot of influence and power, and their ability to move funds around for personal projects would make today's Russian oligarchs weep for joy. They would even initiate 
initiate projects just to spite other branches, an example being the A-10, which started life as a spite project because the Air Force didn't want to use a Navy design, and the F-14 because the Navy didn't want to use an Air Force design, and the Comanche stealth attack helicopter because the Army wanted to do everything by itself. Getting all these people together in a- the Comanche alone! It has perfect potential! We could have used that. That thing would have been a great fucking helicopter. A room to agree in a single aircraft was somewhat akin to having Margaret Thatcher and Jerry Adams shake hands. The required jet, according to the Air Force and Navy, would need to be capable of going supersonic, be equipped with advanced missile systems, be capable of dropping nukes, operate from carriers, perform surveillance missions, interceptions, regular patrols, strategic bombing and electronic warfare, as well as be able to manoeuvre at both high and low altitudes. Now this… this was problematic. To cut a long and very boring science lesson short, the air is thick. Yes. The faster you go, the more it pushes back, and thus the more powerful an engine you need to maintain speed, and thus the more fuel you'll consume. So you need big wings that create a lot of downforce, because the more downforce you have, the more lift you have, and the faster, I'm, I'm simplifying but bear with me, you will theoretically turn. Get that mixture wrong and you'll end up with a Lockheed F-104 Starfighter, mm. the worst plane ever made. Do not worry, I will get to that. Oh, we'll wait. all get to I, that. I can't the problem wait. with building a plane like this is sometimes planes need to go high, and the higher up you are, the thinner the air gets. Uh, up there, having big air-breathing engines is not a good idea. There's just not enough air to feed them. Yes. They tend to get very hot and do things like melt or catch fire. And though you can fly faster with much less fuel, those big wings you have are going to cause so much drag that if you attempt to maneuver in the same way at that speed, they're going to snap off. What you want is swept back wings, but that offers low maneuverability at low altitudes and can make the aircraft very unstable at low speeds. This is the big problem that fighter aircraft designers are always faced with. What altitude do you design your planes to operate in, high or low? If you get it wrong, you end up with the Falkland scenario, where the British Air Force and Harriers, designed for low altitude operations, absolutely kicked the ass out of the Argentinian Air Force. We had things like the Mirage 3, high altitude fighters, who got outmaneuvered when they tried to engage the British at low altitude. Now, there are ways around this. Typically high altitude aircraft have an advantage over low altitude simply because of height hey, and the ability to dive from an opponent. Bomber attempting to fly around radar sites and mountains, having an ability to remain maneuverable at low altitude is not an advantage you can afford to lose. So what the fuck do you do here? Well, many ideas are proposed. The Air Force considered a plane that could be held within a larger plane, and then detach its supersonic shell to go subsonic when needed. This would be a waste of material and relieve parts of an expensive plane all across a foreign power's territory. So the Navy came up with an idea of having a plane that could transform instead, folding its wings back into itself to create a sort of wedge shape that would allow it to remain maneuverable and fast Macon at high altitude. Cat, that is very typical. That's when the arguments began. The Navy wanted their own plane that could carry huge fuel loads without the need for external pods. They also didn't want ejector seats because those were an Air Force thing. Instead, they wanted an escape pod, which they actually got. The Air Force wanted the aircraft to be thinner and have tandem seating with two separate radar displays. The Navy wanted side-by-side -side seating so the pilots could share a radar screen. The Navy wanted it to go Mach 2, the Air Force Mach 2.3. The Air Force Jesus. demanded it handle 7G, and the Navy wanted this preposterously huge radar put into it. On and on this went. Children, sit the fuck down. Jesus. Oh, what the? There we go. Children, shut the fuck up and sit the fuck down. Christ almighty. God, me and my sister don't bicker as much. Jesus. What the hell? Why is it? What is this? Is there something on the glass? Hang on a second, everyone. Is that better? Hmm. Weird. Jesus Christ, children. Calm down, you're both beautiful. Numerous companies attempting to entertain both sets of designs and almost all were rejected. Outside of Boeing. Boeing had created a design that in some bizarre miracle, both branches liked. It did everything they both wanted it to do, but then McNamara came in, and he didn't like it. The problem with Boeing's concept was that it shared very little components between the Air Force and the Navy's design. It was effectively two separate aircraft which would limit the ability for both branches to standardise. This was not what he wanted, so he told them to try again, and again, 
and again. And in spite of finally having committee approval, in spite of having both branches ready to shake hands on Boeing's design, McNamara instead chose the design of General Dynamics. This turned out to be a good thing, because in 1964, General Dynamics would achieve perfection. Yes! was one of the most successful bombers of its day, and the reformers absolutely hated it. Yes, this was an F-111 video the entire time I pulled a sneaky on you. The reformers believed that aircraft didn't need radar or fancy electronics, that precision bombing was just a fantasy, and that missiles were unreliable wonder weapons that could never beat the gun and the clever pilot. But the F-111 proved otherwise. Its ability to strike at targets with laser precision earned it the nickname The Air Assassin. In fact, it was so good at precision bombing, it would beat the reformers' champion, the A-10 Warthog, at the one thing it was designed to do. Tank busting. In fact, during Operation Desert Storm, it would fly more sorties and rack far more kills than any other plane. In fact, the F-111s were switched to a tank hunting role in order to compensate for the poor performance of the A-10s. The F-111s could operate at night, which was not something the A-10s could do. They could fly in bad weather, which was not something the A-10s could do. And they had the uncanny ability to recognize the difference between an Iraqi truck and a British scimitar tank. Again, not something the A-10 could do. Yeah. This infuriated the reformers, who tried to label it the pig, fat and slow, something F-111 pilots would wear as a badge of honour, officially adopting the name F-111 Advark in 1996. Sorry, F-111 Advark. <laughs> You happy? I yes! Think. And though the reformers have done a successful job at thrashing the reputation of the F-111, it was not a plane without its faults. It was expensive, and it was considered by ground crews to be an absolute maintenance nightmare. In fact, it's no surprise when the F-111 was finally retired, the suicide rates among ground crew chiefs dropped significantly. <laughs> <It wasn't... laughs> okay, that's funny. Okay, that's funny. Okay. Quick little rant because yeah, uh, this 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 magnificent work of art. Yes, okay, Mac, you've earned you've Mac, you've earned some leeway with me. You've earned some leeway. But yes, this wonderful work of art, this beauty. Just to tell you how awesome this aircraft is. This was this this was the plane that put the fear of God into dictators. Saddam was scared of this plane. Gaddafi was scared of this plane. If you were a dictator abusing his people, you were scared of this plane because this thing could let, drop so much hurt on you that it would it would be a that literally when Gaddafi escaped just, just fucking escaped getting completely smacked by these aircraft cuz 1990s some Gaddafi's doing some doing some evil fucking shit supporting terrorism doing all that horrible shit Fucking America's like, oh no, bitch, not today. They send two aardvarks armed with all of the more bombs than God. And they level his presidential palace. They level it. And it was only by sheer pure luck Gaddafi wasn't there that night. There's this great, there's this amazing footage of him taken by the Libyan media of him outside the demolished remnants of his palace. And he's digging through the wreckage. And the look on his face is just, like, sheer terror. He's like, 
Like, it was so fucking bad. He had a full-size compound. Like, this, he built a compound that was basically ring after ring to protect him. And it was a covered with tanks, troops, anti-aircraft batteries. It was, un, it was literally a hedgehog. And he would, and he would cower in there. Because he was scared of this aircraft. I guarantee you, you give me a squadron of these fuckers. Modernized, of course. Brought up to modern standards, of course. With modern systems and modern bombs. I could end every dictatorship in the world. In a day. North Korea, done. China, done. Russia, done. Belarus, you're goddamn right, done. Our bark. Mm. Really as bad as the reformers claimed. Well, technically, no. And in fact, the reformers struggled for years to find ways to criticize it, so simply resorted to making stuff up. Their smoking gun was the failure of the F-111B, the Sea Pig. The Navy eventually refused to adopt the F-111 after deciding they no longer needed a tactical nuclear-capable strike bomber, and instead what they needed was a tactical nuclear-capable strike fighter. Remember those factions that were arguing at the Pentagon over fighter bombers and dedicated fighters? Yep. By now they had come to an agreement to build the F-15, but the Navy didn't like this. The Air Force had brought in John Boyd, one of the more famous members of the Reformers Club, to help them design an aircraft based on all the ridiculous specifications that had been proposed. Now, I've never seen those specifications. They do exist in an archive somewhere, along with what I'm told is plans for an F-111 with podded engines, which sounds absolutely hilarious, but I can't get into that archive archive unless I am a serving member of the US military. Most military archives in the US are either closed, open only to military personnel, or so underfunded, understaffed, and badly organized that trying to find anything in them is like trying to find an exceptionally small piece of hay in an impossibly large sized pile of needles. This is why I- Uh, to answer your question, Lack, um... Here's the thing, like, yes, I wouldn't need to modernize it to deal with Russia, but the reason I wanted to modernize it is because I want to get done quickly, I want to get it done with over with. A standard one, I'd probably need two days to deal with Russia. A modernized aardvark, I'd probably do it in about an hour. I want to get home. I want to have lunch. I laugh when people tell me, Oh, I've been to an archive, actually. Because they think it's like a library and everything's organized. They're not expecting to be led into something akin to the back rooms and pointed to a large pile of cardboard boxes, all stacked on top of each other, some of which are inevitably damp and contain more dead flies and should be legally allowed. So, if any four-star generals are watching this and feel generous enough to grant me an advisory position that gives me a service rank and a DOD card so I can visit these archives, that would be greatly appreciated. It also means I can technically apply for US citizenship for when I'm old and retired, because apparently you can buy a house in Alaska that's 200 miles from any known civilization. And that sounds quite pleasant, if I'm honest. Mm. Anyway, what was I saying? Oh yeah, so boy just dragged into the F-15 program. I'll talk about that in detail on a different mm. day, but needless to say, the plain Boyd and the rest of the reformers proposed, dubbed Project Redbird, had no missile payload and very little fuel. What the this was accepted at the time as the Air Force had been made development head of the project, and thus the F-15 was dictated as Air Force needs first, modified to naval needs later. This caused the Navy to walk out on the program, and now hating the Air Force even more, decided they needed their own high-speed jet interceptor capable of ground attack with a variable geometry wing. The F-111 simply wasn't designed to be a fighter. It had never been part of the original specifications, so the Navy canned it. I'm going to go on to build the F-14. The reformers saw this Which as their amazing. smoking gun. The Navy had dumped the expensive can't dogfight flying pig and gone for the more sleek dogfighter jet with a gun. Of course, and yes, I am fully aware the F-14 has a lot of fans who are very dedicated and can write an extravagantly long paragraph faster than I can breathe, so I'm just digging my own grave at this point. The F-14 wasn't all sunshine and roses. No, fans of the F-14 tend to gloss over the early periods in which it was essentially just an expensive hangar queen. It was maintenance yeah. heavy, Early notoriously days, yes. unreliable, and had a worse turning circle than the F-4 Phantom, an aircraft with a famously bad turning circle. But the thing is, the F-14 didn't need to be super maneuverable. No. In Iran, when it did encounter those highly maneuverable jet fighters that could dogfight like the reformers wanted, like it won every yeah. single time. 
and not by outmaneuvering them, not by outturning them or using its gun, but because it could perform over the horizon attacks, striking at an enemy who weren't even aware they were being targeted. The reformers touted the F-14 because to them it was an agile gunfighter which proved that missiles and radar were dumb and expensive and that air battles were decided by turning circles in a dogfight. Nope. But in reality, the F-14 proved the exact opposite. The F-14 was a long-range missile assassin. Even in red flag operations with international partners, NATO pilots would confess fearing a fight with the F-14 because oh, yeah. it meant being hit by something you didn't know was there at a range you couldn't fire back at. And so it is with the F-111. Everything the reformers hated about it was because it didn't need to be what they thought it should be. It didn't need to be maneuverable. It didn't need to have the pilots visually identify the target by looking at the ground. It didn't need to carry a shitload of bombs to destroy a single target. It didn't need a long loiter time or a titanium bathtub to protect the crew against people with guns shooting up at it. It could fly fast, it could fly low, and it could strike a target with pinpoint precision, wiping out anything from buildings, tanks, factories, and fortified positions with a single bomb, and then hightailing it out of there before the enemy could return fire. <laughs> it was everything the modern bomber needed to be, and it proved that precision bombing wasn't a fantasy, it was the future. But the march of time goes on. With improving technology, it was becoming somewhat obvious that even the idea of low-flying bombers would soon be obsolete. Look-down, shoot-down radar was fast becoming a thing, a radar system which, when mounted onto a high point or an aircraft, could effectively screen out ground clutter, and anything travelling close to the ground, under the radar, so to speak, that got caught in this radar sight, would effectively be lit up like a Christmas tree. The system had been around since the late 60s, and now with its widespread adoption, including by the Soviets, the idea of flying low to avoid radar was quickly becoming a thing of the past. The F-111 was still a vastly superior bomber compared to its contemporaries, but the lessons learned from its use had been learned. Cheaper aircraft could now deliver the same bombs with the same precision. The one thing the F-111 had been good at, flying low and fast, was no longer a trait exclusive to it. Although it would continue as a bomb truck, the Advark was solely regulated to high-speed reconnaissance and electronic warfare, but even then the maintenance cost of the aircraft was so vast, the fleet was allegedly sucking up around 25% of the Air Force's total maintenance budget. It would be retired from US service in 1993, with the last of the F-111 still flying for the Australian Air Force until 2010. But the bomber wasn't dead. The problem had just become even more complicated. You could have a plane that can sit high up directing radar beams at the ground and can spot aircraft flying low, and a regular radar keeping track of anything flying high. How do you get a bomber through without being detected? I mean, yes, you can take advantage of terrain and fly through mountain passes and riverbeds, where even look down radar has its limitations, but you can't always rely on the enemy having a neat little line of mountain passes leading directly to the target you want to bomb. Yep. Or if they do, being naive enough to not suspect you probably use it to bomb them, and either be patrolling it aggressively or have some sort of early warning system in place. Mm. Effectively, you need another solution. And I know you've been ever so patient as this video drives 20 miles away from the point and then kicks you out the car and tells you to walk back, but that is where our humble little F-117 finally comes in. <laughs> Remember that? Remember what I was yes. talking about before I started okay. rambling? God, I am a terrible YouTuber. So, the question was, hey, no why is stealth? Me. Well, stealth is the solution to the next problem. Yes. If you can't avoid radar, make something radar can't see. Simple. Easy peasy lemon squeezy, right? Well, no, it's lemon lemon difficult lemon. Radar can be tuned to detect something as small and as soft as a bird, which is essentially just a ball of feathers and anger. And if you can't hide a bird from radar, how do you hide a plane? Well, thankfully, in the 1940s, dates differ on who you ask, Lockheed, a company who builds planes, was approached by the American government and asked if they could build a plane. Now, normally, this wouldn't be a problem. Lockheed is really good at building planes. In fact, there's this big plane right outside their building to remind you that is what they do. But the plane the US wanted was a weird one. It didn't have any propellers. They wanted 
a B-59. jet plane. This was weird because the US military had spent most of the 1930s claiming the idea of jet engines was a fad. They were unreliable, too mechanically complex, and too fuel hungry to ever work. And then the Americans went on a fact finding mission to Britain. Apparently, they were looking to buy the Mosquito, though some sources do differ. During the meeting, one American general leaned over to one of the engineers and <laughs> chuckled, You know, some people say we should be investing in jet engines. To which the engineer replied, You should. You want to see ours? And did that happen? I don't know, probably not exactly like that. But the Americans got to see the Gloucester E-2839, Britain's experimental jet plane. And immediately, they bought one. And then they took it to Lockheed and said, what can you do with this? Take the engine out, get rid of all this British shit, and make it more American. We want you to build us an all-American jet fighter. And Lockheed gently patted the general on the head and said, Sure, we'll get right on that, sir. The problem was, Lockheed was busy. Yeah. Busy making money. They were building planes. They were actually building planes for the British at the time, and they didn't feel like wasting all their money and some of their best engineers chasing a prototype for a plane that might never be built. It was madness. So what Lockheed did was it drove around America in a van collecting every sort of mentally unstable genius they could find. <laughs> if you'd ever been questioned by the authorities for building a nuclear reactor in your bedroom when you were 12, if you'd built a rocket and tried to launch your old school hamster into space, if you were the kind of person who spent all their time building building paper airplanes, obsessing over the design until they could fly hundreds of meters away and then picked them up and ran through your house making noises while in your 30s, then Lockheed was rapidly approaching your location. They took all these aircraft engineers with questionable levels of sanity, dumped them into a circus tent, painted a large cartoon animal on the front and watched to see what they would do. And thus, Lockheed Skunk Works was born. The aircraft they would produce included the P-38, the P-80, the U-2 spy plane, the SR-71, the D-21, the F-22, the F-35, the Sea Shadow, the whatever the fuck this thing is, and apparently a fusion reactor. Because they had to save money on their electricity bill. Seriously. Go America. The general Thank insanity you. of whatever comes out of Skunk Works is well known and highly revered. So if I Honestly, like, the more I look, like, and here's the thing, one of Skunk Works' most famous installations, one where they actually do a lot of their testing, Area 51. There aren't any aliens there! Aliens don't want to visit us! All that's there is a bunch of crazy, is a bunch, here's, here's the thing, I'm going to tell you what's probably inside Area 51. I'm going to tell you what's probably inside. I wouldn't know, if I knew, I'd probably be locked up there. But, more than likely, what's inside Area 51? A bunch of science nerds with too much time on their hands, too much fucking money, and they're just going, and they all have that skunk work logo on their, on their, on their shirts, and they're all going, what can we do? What kind of batshit insane stuff? Like, Ten Buck says they're, they'll, they'll, they're all just sitting in a room, and then they're gonna go, and then one of them's gonna go, I've got it. We take... We take the SR-71 and we put a reactor in it, along with a rail gun that shoots kittens. And somebody in there will say, "Brilliant, let's do it." I'm pretty sure that's what the I'm pretty sure that's what they're gonna like. Ah, what they build now, a nuclear-powered SR-71 with a rail gun that fires kittens. Oh, what else? Oh, they also built this amazing stealth fire that can't be detected by most water, modern radar and carries enough f enough munitions to level half a fucking Pyongyang. Tell them we'll think about the SR seventy one railgun with kittens, and we'll take the one with the, and the, we'll take the actually kick ass one. That I guarantee you is what happens at Skunk Works. <laughs> Oh, I guarantee you that shit. Those fuckers are insane. Oh, oh, I guarantee you they're all furries. I guarantee you those fuckers are furries. I'm a furry. I've been in the furry community for a while now. I know us. Uh, we uh, we're we're crazy. We're crazy. I'm not gonna deny that. If anyone was going to crack the radar problem, it was Skunk Works. And thankfully, they had been tinkering with the idea since the 1950s. Now this. Mm -hmm. This is where things get fucky. Uh, the fuck? 
Skunk Works apparently doesn't have much luck in designing a stealth aircraft. The Opti idea potentially could be possible, and they have some theories, but they can't qu- what the Hey, thanks, Marcus! Thanks for the five bucks! Appreciate that! Oh yeah, Cole will appreciate those cookies. What do I think about the new Sig Sauer Assault Rifle? Is shit. Is shit. Most modern stuff is shit. Thank you, though, for the four bucks. Appreciate it. For, well, technically the five. Thank you. Thank you. Koa appreciates you. I appreciate you. You get treats in his belly and lo my lights on. Thank you. Continuing on. Quite work in art. And then one of them discovers a scientific paper, which basically unlocks the whole thing. Now, what this paper was is a subject of some debate, and I'm going to cover that for a second because it has all the hallmarks of some major fucky wucky. The name I hear a lot is Russian scientist Peter Utsev, whose name I'm definitely saying wrong. It's the name that comes up a lot in documentaries, and it's the one mentioned by Thad Darger, the former pilot of the F-117, when he's going over the history of the plane. Coincidentally, it's also the name cited by Wikipedia. The source for that name appears to be, well, himself. The other name is Scottish physicist James Clark Maxwell. This is the one cited by the Stealth Fighter Association, a non-profit organization that documents the history of specifically the F-117, old reunions for its pilots, and whose board of directors includes former pilots, engineers, and maintenance personnel. So on one hand, a scientist on the USSFR who published his paper on the USSFR, whom Skunk Works would not have been able to see until the late 90s, long after the plane was built, as cited by a dodgy source on the internet encyclopedia that anyone can edit, and is famous for being wrong precisely because anyone can edit it, or the work of a Scottish mathematician who died in 1879, long before the invention of both radar and aircraft. Now, yeah. Scotland does have a long list of inventions, some of which include the telephone, the steam engine, the fax machine, the kaleidoscope, penicillin, television, cloning, the MRI scanner, refrigeration, disposable contact lenses, the ATM, the flushing toilet, vacuum flasks, fingerprinting, comic books, and the concept of time itself. But I don't honestly believe Scotland was building stealth bombers in 1879. Or were they? Scotland! No, the work being cited is Maxwell's dynamic theory. Scotland, do you scare me? Theory of electromagnetic fields, which talks about how magnetic fields travel through the air at the speed of light in waves, and the shape of those waves can mean different things. Unfortunately, he used a lot of big words that I don't understand, and I fell asleep while trying to read it, but basically the man discovered electromagnetic and radio waves. He is also considered one of the most intelligent men who ever lived, is the father of electrical engineering, special relativity, and quantum mechanics, and just for fun, one summer invented the color photograph. Albert Einstein considered him a mentor. He was also hilariously arrogant and didn't enjoy the company of anyone he thought was dumber than him, which, when you are the smartest man alive, is pretty much everyone. Wow. Yes, he's basically Scottish Rick Sanchez. Marty! Get in the car, Marty! Get in the car! Don't think too hard on that one. I don't that said, to. the work of Peter Imtsev cannot be discredited because of a source on Wikipedia was a bit dodgy. The man was also a genius and was born at a time where radar and planes existed. His work specifically cites the reflection of electromagnetic waves. His work was supposedly published internationally because it was not considered by the Soviets to have any real military value. Boy, were they wrong. And since realizing their mistake, Russia has thrown almost every scientific award they can think of at the man's feet, and have proudly added stealth technology to the list of Russian inventions, which I am taking away from them because, as I'll remind you, the rule is it's who builds it first and gets it working, not comes up with the idea. So which one of these guys should get credit for being the father of modern stealth? Well, none of them. Maxwell was a genius, but the work cited as a number of ciphers predicting how electromagnetic waves would react under certain circumstances. It was Skunk Works who deciphered them. Yutsev was equally as brilliant, but his work was about radio wave reflections, not about stealth planes. It was Skunk Works who figured out how his theories could be applied to modern aircraft. It was Ed Martin, it was Ben Rich, it was Bill Schrodinger, it was Dennis Overhauser, as well as a number of other uncredited engineers who put it all together and figured it all out not anyone else. The work of Maxwell and Yutsev may have laid the foundations, but they alone did not invent stealth aircraft. And I know that seems like a meaningless rant, but honestly, I, I, I felt like it was important to just get that out there. History can be a bit weird like this. Anyway, yeah. I'm rambling again. So Skunk Works have got this idea that they could 
possibly build a plane that could go undetected by radar, solving the problem of the bomber not getting through. But Lockheed don't fund random fantasies, so onto the shelf it goes. Up until about 1975, when McDonnell Douglas thinks they've cracked it. They propose to the Pentagon that they can build a plane that is radar invisible. Now DARPA get excited. This is exactly what they've been looking for. So they propose to several companies if they can build it, then they will helicopter in a shipping container full of cash from the black budget, which means it's tax free. Now McDonnell Douglas eventually drop out, claiming they just couldn't design or build the required aircraft, leaving just Northrop and Lockheed in the race, and both come up with competing designs. Now, the story behind Lockheed's design is famous enough, most people probably know it by name, and if you said Hopeless Diamond, you were wrong. In fact, the history of the project is largely incorrect. According to DARPA themselves, in this wonderfully colourful poem they wrote, A moth disappears against the bark of the tree of which it has landed. An octopus vanishes its skin, assuming the pattern and texture of its surroundings. That stealth of an ancient and biological kind. I, I mean, whatever. Lockheed was not actually invited to take part. DARPA were not allowed to talk to Lockheed because of their work on the SR-71, and it wasn't until much later that they were finally granted permission by the CIA that they learned that Lockheed had been tinkering with something and got them involved. You want to seriously drop to your knees and thank every god you know and every star you see that they did this. Because as each one of those other companies dropped out, unable to crack it, only Northrop were able to build a working stealth plane. And it looked like this. The single ugliest aircraft ever made by man. I'm just gonna say this. It looks like a butter dish. I'm not joking. Hold up right there. I'll prove it to you. That thing looks like a butter dish. I'll prove it to you. One second. Look, 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 I put it side by side. It's a fucking butter dish. It's a goddamn butter dish. <laughs> look at, look at that. It's a fucking butter dish. <laughs> I just saw it. I like, like, I saw it. I'm just like, that's a goddamn butter dish. <laughs> The arrow Twinkie? <laughs> okay. What the fuck? How is that? The flying butter dish. <laughs> I just saw that. I just saw that. Oh my god. And I included in that the fairy Garnet. The Northrop Tactic Blue, nicknamed the Whale, was originally not the a whale. bomber, but a surveillance aircraft like designed to replace more. the U-2 spy plane. And as you might expect, it flew like a brick, attached to a cow, attached to an even bigger, angrier brick. With this at the helm, the advent of stealth would have been a generation of aircraft that looked like the magic school bus. <laughs> Gee, Miss Frizzle, I sure hope this is just a regular school trip. No, cats, we're going to recon military targets in Kosovo! Yeah! <laughs> oh, oh, I digress. The stealth whale wouldn't make it into production. Northrop would fly it every day for about two years as if to try and prove it could fly and had its uses, but the army would never adopt it. It now sits at the National <laughs> Museum of the United so States hard. Air Force at Wright Patterson Air Force Base near Dayton, Ohio. Hangar 4, if you're interested. And to be fair to Northrop, the technology developed for it and the lessons learned in its use and its construction were later further developed into the B-2 Spirit, which took the concepts developed by the F-117 and ramped it up to 11. But getting back on topic, Lockheed have just been given the promise of a shitload of money and getting to kick their market rival Northrop in the shins. And best of all, their insane asylum disguised as an aircraft factory skunk works was getting bored of the SR-71 and were kicking around looking for things to do. And when skunk works gets bored, that's when you start worrying. So, a shiny new project that should take them years of pissing around time should do just the trick and what do you mean they've already built something? It took skunk works 
a little over a year to produce a model. A the project year? was called Harvey, after the 1950s film Harvey, about a giant rabbit that only the lead character could see. But after a long discussion and quite a lot of coffee, Lockheed were able to convince Skunk Works to build a plane, as opposed to a giant invisible rabbit. And thus, work began. That's not actually true. According to Jack Twig, the former project manager of the Half Blue Project, the codename Harvey was completely made up by the Pentagon. No one on the project ever referred to it as such. Though I'd already written that joke by the time I learned that, so I, I wasn't going to change it. Because, goddamn, that was funny, right? The dog is summoning me. Koa, I'm in here! Koa, come here, boy! Koa, where are you at, buddy? Koa. Koa. Why are you barking? Come over here. You want to hang out with me? Come over here. Plus, you know everyone on YouTube likes seeing you. Get up on your futon. Get up here, buddy. Get up there. Koa. Yes, buddy. I laughed! Stop judging me! In a book written by Ben Rich, who was the head of Skunk Works in 1975, no one in Lockheed even knew that DARPA was putting out contracts for stealth planes, until their in-house Soviet weapons expert literally blew the door down and told them all about it. He'd learned because the other companies DARPA had invited to compete in the contract, Fairchild and Grumman, had bowed out. But General Electric was causing a stink, because they claimed they could do it with electromagnetic waves. General Electric were attempting to build a cloaking device with magnets. Go America! Either way, their engineers blabbed, and for some reason DARPA didn't Empire. think that the idea they were putting out contracts for stealth planes should be kept top secret. So the hobbyist community started to learn about it. And then they started coming up with ideas and what it would look like, which eventually evolved into what is widely considered to be the first ever true meme of non-credible defense. Oh. The F-19 which you can still buy models of. It's one of the best-selling models of all time. Journalists used I to take bet. models of it to the press conferences and be like, we can buy models of it, why can't you just admit that it's real? Which I completely understand. I mean, I can buy all these models of Catboys everywhere, and yet NASA still refuses to tell me where the portal to the Catboy dimension is. No matter how many letters I send, why won't you tell me, NASA? What are you hiding from me? Either way, Lockheed, we're Jesus now in the race. Christ. And now, we finally get to the part that everybody knows after... Jesus, how long have I been rambling? Why are you subscribed to me? I am an awful YouTuber, because you're seriously. A fun guy and Bill Schrodinger was able to sketch out a design for an aircraft that Scott Works believed would have a low radar signature, which took advantage of something called faceting, a method which, rather than absorb or nullify radar signatures, deflected them away from the return path of enemy radar, meaning that array never got a return signal, and thus should see nothing. With this sketch, they ran the design through Lockheed's computers, trying to mathematically work out the most optimal angles. This was then converted into a model which was called Da -da -da, the Hopeless Diamond. Dubbed that for the regular engineers at Lockheed hated its angular shape. They liked smooth, curved surfaces. This thing was all flat and angular and something something aerodynamics. So they so the, so even before the Cybertruck, we were we were bitching about how things look like look like sharp, flat angles rather than smooth and cisper. If you like the F one seventeen, you have no right to bitch about the Cybertruck anymore. There. Okay, moving on. They believed that A, it wouldn't work, and B, it wouldn't fly. So, they set up a big pole, put the plane on top, and fired a radar beam at it. Now, after a bit of adjusting, they got a return on the pole. And then finally, the plane popped up on radar. It gave a weak return, roughly the size of a bird. But for some reason, the plane was appearing several feet above the pole. The eyes of every engineer slowly turned to look at the model. And there was a bird perched on top of it. The plane... <laughs> was completely invisible to radar. DARPA would test both designs, and though promising, Northrop's design was not completely as stealthy as advertised. At certain angles, it was detectable, and DARPA had concerns that the engineers working on the project were unexperienced on working under top-secret protocols. This was not a concern for Lockheed, whose demonstration model passed every test and was subsequently declared the winner. The project was dubbed Have Blue, and finally top-secret protocols were put in place, officially making it a black project. In 1988, it was finally revealed to the public. Uh, wait, I like electric cars because currently we're running out of gas, like the world's running out of gas and oil, and let's face it, I'm tired of paying $80 at the pump whenever I need to take my dog to the fucking park. Yes, I have a big car. 
Why? Because of him. Because he's huge. So yeah, elect. I am all. I am very pro electric. Moving on. Like and thus the legend of the Nighthawk was born. Damn right. And then the argument began. Of course. The F-117 was a bomber that, in reality, did not exactly improve on the ideology of what a bomber is. For all rights and purposes, the F-111 was vastly superior in terms of bombing capability, and the reformers would always latch on to this. World War II bombers, even the shit ones, had larger bomb capacities. The F-117 could only carry two bombs. It was slow, it was fuel-hungry, and it was a maintenance changed. nightmare. It was one of the most temperamental aircrafts ever made, and it came at a cost of roughly 120 22 million in 1998 money, yeah. depending on which source you look at. The cost was so high because of the amount of advanced computers required to fly it. The yeah. weird angular design made it stealthy, but not exactly aerodynamic. So much so that the prototypes were known as the Wobbly Goblins. They were inhumanely difficult to fly, and it was only because of the aircraft's fly-by-wire system that it was capable of flight at all. And this idea of stealth, the reformers claimed was just a gimmick, an expensive gimmick, and one that didn't really come with any great advantage. Look down radar is required to be mounted high up on another aircraft, which isn't really a problem if the enemy can't launch any because you're dominating the skies with your highly maneuverable jet fighters. And they claimed, once the Soviets learned about this new stealth fighter, it wouldn't take them long to retune their radars, or develop new radar systems, or that stealth systems incorporated by Lockheed were vulnerable to certain lower frequencies and techniques used by highly powered or older generation radar systems. In essence, it wasn't stealthy at all, and in 1999, in the skies over Serbia, the reformers would get their vindication. Oh, yeah, that incident. It's 1999. A war in Yugoslavia has been raging since February of the previous year. Now, I'm not going to get into all the nuance and politics Apparently of that. needs to get outside. Uh, yeah. Five pounds from Scotland! Wow! Thank you! Thanks for five pounds! Bring on the laser... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for also the very first super on livestream. Thank you very much, Skulden. Thank you. I really, really appreciate it. And yes, I would love to do a podcast with Pig. Maybe we could talk about what that time I said that the ATTE is better than most modern tanks. I would love to. I, I'd love to. I'd like to. I'd like to go on trial for that. Thank you very much. Anyway, excuse me. The dog needs outside time. Why? Why? Because you're such a baby. Oh, no, 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 no. Yes, you're such a baby. You're such a big baby. You just want my attention. You're a prima donna. You're a big. You're a bigger drama queen than I am. Look at your sniffing. Go ahead. You know. You know the system. Just knock. Knock or bark. One of the two. <laughs> and try not to have a conversation with the other neighbor's dogs. I swear, I can hear him from a mile away. I'm not even joking. <laughs> oh yes, Kosovo, the world, the, the biggest world, the world's biggest proof that uh, humanity is shit. Moving on. War or the situation which caused its buildup. What I will say is the Wikipedia article for the Kosovo War has to be one of the longest on the site and has yep. a section on known mass graves. Yeah. That should give you some clues as to no. why I'm maybe skipping. I also like how it says known mass graves because it is also known that the ones we found are certainly not the end of them. <sighs> it would take me several hours to explain and people would still get mad at me in the comments. Needless yep. to say, NATO intervenes and a long and aggressive bombing campaign against military targets in Serbia begins. Part of this NATO deployment is a section of F-117s. Weather is bad and they are mostly flying at night. Serbian air defense is using mostly outdated and low-tech equipment. Maintenance of that equipment is expected to be very bad and therefore not really a threat. Regular non-stealth aircraft have been flying in and out and harassing the radar stations with seed weapon. And there he is. Good boy. Good boy. Lay down. Just lay 
down. Lay down. Lay down, buddy. Here's your good boy. Anyway. Anyway, continuing on. Auto seeking missiles specifically designed to home in on radar installations, so no one was expecting any problems. With the F 117s being radar invisible, they should have no issues. And that was the general feeling on the night of March the 20th. Like my admin tribal there says, if you want to leave reaction suggestions and such like that, join my Discord. Links down there. And there's a reaction suggestion in there. <laughs> 7th, 1999, when a squadron of four F 117s entered Serbian airspace. They knew the Serbian air defenses would be hunting them, but they expected almost total immunity. The black jets remained grouped until they hit the border, and then each split off, moving towards their own designated targets. And as one of those F 117s turned to home in on their designated target, something very interesting happened. The pilot spotted a missile flying towards them. There were no other planes in the air, nothing nearby. This was a radar guided missile. Locking on to him. Through sheer luck, the first missile missed. The second one did not. And though the pilot bailed and was later rescued, this was the first recorded shootdown of an F-117. The first combat loss of a stealth fighter. And what had done it was nothing more than a simple, outdated radar SAM site from the 1960s, operating in low frequency mode. It was a national embarrassment. Overnight, the man who had been manning the battery, Colonel Zoltan Dani, had become a national hero. It was a massive propaganda victory for Serbia, who still celebrate it to this day. And for the reformers, it was all the proof they needed. If an older radar system could shoot down an F-117, then the whole stealth thing was really just an expensive gimmick. And that was the bottom bottom line. Or was it? Um, okay, this may seem a bit like a diversion, but in 1966, England won the Football World Cup. Soccer, to my American audience, beating Germany 4-2. I mean, they've never won it again, but this single victory, even though it was nearly 60 years ago, even though most of the players and the people at the match have now since passed away, is as much ingrained into English culture as tea and biscuits. It's referenced almost constantly. Anytime there is a match between England and Germany, chants of two world wars and one world cup dominate <laughs> the air. It even almost made it into the national anthem. The Germans, wow. however, find this rather surprising. I mean, not only are they completely unaware of this culture, they just don't really get what the big deal is. They don't consider 1966 to be one of their great football losses, nor do they consider England to be one of their greatest rivals. Ooh. Germany has won the Football World Cup four times. But you see, because it's England, and England sees that one victory is an equal to that of winning the Second World War, and Germany simply doesn't care, it's meant that England is pretty much at liberty to dictate how the whole thing went down. They produce books, films, documentaries, Trees, interview the players, but because it's such a strong point of national pride, it all has to be structured in a way that doesn't cause upset to Big Barry and the Brexit bunch, because that's your target audience. <laughs> and because there is no audience for the opposite, there has never really been much opposition or critique of the facts the English present. Simply put, no one cares. And the shutdown of the F-117 over Serbia is pretty much like that. In Serbia, that one shutdown is a point of national pride beyond almost anything else. They have produced countless books and documentaries about it, they've got a museum dedicated to it, the man who did it is a national hero. And there are reasons for this. England still froths at the mouth over 1966 because England believes it is the best at football. They invented it, they are the only country which plays it correctly, even if though since 1930 they have lost 21 out of the 22 World Cup. Brazil would like a word with you, England. F and I do say this. Here's the thing, like, I know British soccer hooligans always get a lot of the news, but I'm more scared of Brazilian football fans than I am of British. Because with Brazil, everyone plays football, plays soccer. Everyone. I mean everyone. I I have believed that Brazilian children, once they pop out in pop into the world, I guarantee you they already know how to play football. It is it is like it is in their bloodstream. Don't fuck with Brazilians.
<laughs> especially on the football field. <laughs> effect they proudly ignore because in their mind they believe that Germany is somehow for some reason still coping and seething at <laughs> this one loss. The idea that they aren't and don't care is something many football fans in England would find deeply insulting. And with the F-117 shootdown it kind of allows Serbia to do the same. You can't look at videos or pictures of the F-117 on the internet without a Serb in the comments reminding you Still lose the war though. I'll say that to Serbia. Yeah, you shot down one stealth, one of our stealth finders. Bravo, bravo, bravo. You still lost the war. No one cares about what you did during the war. All that, all that matters is the end result. Did you win? No. that they shot one down. In their mind, they still believe that the United States of America, the most powerful military force on the planet, is still coping and seething that Serbia, little Serbia with its backwards military, was able to take down one of their most advanced fighter jets. But it also helps gloss over the realities of the Kosovo War that many people in Serbia still feel uncomfortable with. So discussions of the Kosovo War are dominated by the tale of Zoltan Dani and the night they shot down a stealth jet, and how clever the Serbs were and how much America underestimated them over things. Yeah, li like Serbia. Mm. Yeah, I just got. I gotta ask. I gotta ask Serbia. Yeah, you want you like talking about this? Uh, any reason why you're uncomfortable talking about what happened during the war? Is it something you probably did or something you were trying to do that would make it very uncomfortable for you talking about shit like that? Hmm. It's like war crimes. And because no one else really cares, the Serbs have been allowed to get away with stating their version of the story as objective fact with little to no cross-examination. And this has been signal boosted in the US by the Reformers Club because it helped demonstrate their narrative. But you see, there is a bit of nuance to this whole reality. The shootdown wasn't exactly as simple as it may seem. For one, the US had been flying in and out of the same airbase every night. Unknown to them, the base was being watched. Serbian spies were held up in a house which overlooked the runway, and from their position they could see what was taking off and what was landing. That night, no other planes left the runway outside of the F-117s. They quickly passed this information along to their commanders. Furthermore, the American bombers took the same path every night, so the Serbians would know exactly which direction they would come from and roughly how long it would be before they arrived. Now knowing the skies would be clear outside of the Nighthawks, every battery in Serbia switched to low frequency mode. They knew they had no other threats to deal with. They knew they could be more active with their radars, as no sea aircraft were operating that night. Which means when the F-117 in question, ducking and weaving through hills and valleys, briefly showed up as an unidentifiable smudge on a local radar, are, they knew exactly what they were looking at. They knew which direction it was going, and the air defense battery nearby knew exactly where to point his radar. And well, this is the part the reformers tend to forget. Danny flipped on his radar. Nothing. He tried again. Nothing. Twice he activated his radar and it told him nothing was there. Had Danny been following standard procedure, turning his radar on for two sweeps meant he was now lit up like a Christmas tree. His position was compromised and most likely a sea aircraft was on its way to deliver several hundred pounds of radar seeking death. He now needed to move and move quickly. But he knew the skies were clear. He knew there were no sea aircraft, just the Nighthawks. So he turned his radar on again. And this time, he got something. By a startling coincidence, at the exact time Danny had turned his radar on, the F-117 had its bomb bay doors open. Oh, One that's brief what moment I figured in that, that must have been what where it would be visible on radar. Okay, okay, quick note, quick note, and this is actually with all stealth aircraft. Here's the thing. A stealth aircraft is only as stealthy as uh, when it's completely sealed up and set and, and perfectly like as it is. However, there's always been the issue, and this has been, and believe it or not, engineers have been fighting with this forever. When the when the weapon bay doors open on stealth fighters, for a split second, the non-stealth interior shows up on radar. I figured that was what killed the F-117. I figured that was what it was. Yep. And Sun Sunling. 
I have heard, like, the thing is, I've heard multiple theories. There's been so many theories. So, yeah. It's nice to see someone else believes that the doors were open. I don't know if they were jammed. Don't know. But, yeah. So, yeah. So, basically, how did the Serbians shoot down an F-117? Sheer dumb luck. Everyone keeps on saying like, "Oh, it's skill. like here's the thing. Here's the thing. Like, you, there are there are even snipers I know, snipers I have met, who sometimes call it. It always comes down to here's the thing. Yes, you have to take take the shot, but sometimes you need a like sniper, like snipers, like snipers, t pilots, anything. They factor in all the other things, but there's one thing that they always have to also factor in, and this is the hardest thing to factor, and that is the minimalist." little bit of luck there's always a little bit like 99 percent of all that militaries do it's all perfectly calculations it's calculations tactics strategy planning and technology all of it but there's that always that little one percent that little one percent of luck that can always be the tipping factor and sometimes it is case in point with an f-117 that one middle lock. Ah, oh, shit, the doors are open. I got something on radar! Launch the missile now! That one bit of luck. Take a look at, like, another one. Take a look at Simo Hayaha, the guy who is basically my mentor in shooting. I've read everything about the man. One guy got lucky. And not only that, he got lucky. Exploding bullet to the face. And he's alive. Luck. Everyone says, oh, I don't need luck. I don't need... Yes, you do need luck. Because if you forget that 1%, you're going to get... It's going to come back to smack you in the face. Especially when you're using missiles. If that 1% is, is attached to a missile, you are fucked. So, yeah. This was luck. To quote Napoleon... Whenever I pick a general, I know, yes, yes, I know he's brilliant, but is he lucky? That's how you became a fucking marshal in, in Napoleonic France. Yes, yes, I know he's good. He's a general. I get it. He's good. He's good. Okay, but is he lucky? Is he lucky? He's lucky? Okay, give him the promotion. He's not lucky? Don't give him the promotion. Dar. To explain just how lucky a shot in the dark this was, the F-117 did not operate like other bombers, where you flip the switch, the doors open, and the bombs drop. The F-117 carries exactly two bombs, typically GBU-12 paveways. These are laser-guided bombs. The system on board the aircraft, once the target has been selected, will automatically deploy the bomb in the most optimal flight path, and then drop the bombs automatically. The trigger on the F-117 is not a trigger, so to speak. It simply gives the plane permission to fire. If that has been pressed, the doors open, the bombs drop, and the second those bombs are clear of the doors, they close. In some cases, those doors can be open for less than a second. Mm -hmm. The shootdown of the F-117 over Serbia was a case of extreme luck and no small part of negligence on the part of NATO. The detection of the F-117 had absolutely nothing to do with the fact the radar was operating in low frequency mode. But that did not stop the reformers, who even today still bang on about the follies of stealth, how old radar systems and even systems from the Second World War can detect them. You even see this when people talk about modern stealth aircraft like the F-35. Harder, my World War II radar can detect it. And because of this, and because of the propaganda around the shootdown, the system that did it, the S-125 Neva, has remained in service. It's a 60-year-old system by now. In fact, if you're a small country with some spare cash, Russia will sell you a slightly upgraded version of this exact weapon system advertised as anti-stealth. Countries that still <laughs> operate it include Azerbaijan, Cuba, Bulgaria, Libya, India, Moldova, North Korea, Serbia, Syria, Turkey, Kazakhstan, Venezuela, Yemen, and even Vietnam. Even the modern S-400 systems currently in use by Russia, and systems built off it like the ones used in China, still follow similar design ideologies, still follow that same principle about what stealth is weak to, and it doesn't work. 
If America needed to invade any of these countries and stealth bombers were part of its campaign, all those countries, all those operators have been trained to immediately switch to lower frequency, and that is not something you want to do. A lower radar frequency can give you a much higher RCS return on any aircraft you might be looking at, but that comes with a significant downside. Lower frequency radar cannot penetrate cloud or rain. It can be affected by flocks of birds, waving trees, high wind, and even direct sunlight. But even if all the conditions are perfect, a lower frequency radar is not just going to pick up planes, it will pick up absolutely everything, including things like radio waves, satellite televisions, phone calls, electromagnetic interference from home computers, power lines, everything like that. If you don't have a system in place to screen all that out, which typically countries still using the S-125 Neva won't have access to, or would otherwise be typically unable to afford, you're left with a man or a woman staring at a screen that has now just become alive with radar blips, trying to find the one blip on the screen that might be a plane in the brief window you have while the radar is on. The radar the Serbs used hit the F-117 twice, and didn't see it. Even in the lower frequency, the F-117 remained invisible until it opened its bomb bay door. And Lockheed knew that. The hopeless diamond model they tested had been tested in the lower frequency band, and its radar return was less than the size of a bird's eye. But because of the story, countries and militaries around the world all operate radar missile defense systems fully believing they can defend themselves against stealth technology that has never been proven to work. And that's why, in my opinion, the reformers have been allowed to get away with this for as long as they have. During the Cold War, it became a necessary part of psychological warfare between the Soviets and the US to overestimate what their equipment was capable of. The Soviets believed if the Americans constantly thought they were playing catch-up, it would deter them from staging an invasion, and with any luck would spend so much money trying to build up uneconomical superweapons they would bankrupt themselves in the process, and then regular Americans living in poverty through lack of public funding would rise up in a populist revolt. This became such a big thing that overstating what their equipment can do has become part of Russian culture. They know their equipment cannot do what is advertised, but they still believe it to be part of some background psychological warfare to intimidate the Americans. And the worst part is, they believe everyone else is doing exactly the same. What they have become increasingly unaware of is when America says its equipment can do certain things, it is more likely an understatement of what it is actually capable of. But as as long as Russia had the designer of the greatest fighter plane ever made coming forth to rant on Russia today about how weak and useless Western military technology was, Traitor. then the illusion would always remain intact. And it's all utter nonsense. The anti-stealth systems that Russia and those named countries think they have is just a regular SAM system, the same kind of system that NATO aircraft have been training to overcome for 60 years. And they've gotten very good at it. And I'd like to say that was the plan all along. I'd love to give credit to some genius because if it was planned, then this would have been the greatest psyops the world has ever seen. But I don't think it was. I think this is just how humans work. Military advisors are ten a penny, quite literally in some cases. Everyone even remotely connected to the military in some regard thinks they know a thing or two, puts on a shirt and tie, and starts calling themselves an advisor. And it's great to have a few military advisors surround you. It gives you credibility, gives you comfort, especially when they rattle off their expertise about where they served and who with, and all the stuff they did, etc, etc. But the vast majority of these guys don't know a damn thing. Typically their knowledge is based on limited personal experience, which comes from brief snapshots of a single military operation, with no real knowledge to the overall big picture which many regard with a certain level of disdain. They can anecdote a bunch of stuff, sure, they can relate everything back to a story that happened to some guys some time ago, they can even identify all the guns and tanks and tell you all their history, but the reality is half these guys come cheap because they have next to no idea what the Jamboree fuckaroo they are talking about. It's a big leap going from knowing how to strip a 50 cal to running an actual military, to go yeah. from naming all the specific parts of an Abrams to being able to predict the future movements of Xi Ping. And the majority of the time, the actual advice they give goes over the heads of the companies they work for, with bitter few exceptions. The majority of former US colonels and NCOs who end up working as advisors are not hired because they are so brilliant or have any unique insight. It's because the company employing them wants to take advantage of their connections when bidding on government contracts. That's it. 
I mean, look at Ukraine. How many of these fuckers got everything wrong and still persistently yes. make incorrect predictions, wanking on and on and on about how tanks are useless and drones are the future, without ever really knowing why drones are being so effective right now. And so it was with anti-stealth stuff. They knew this one example where one got shot down by this specific system, knew it had something to do with low-frequency radar, put two and two together, and got seven. They knew the surface logic, essentially, but didn't understand the full circumstances. And as time has moved on, the F-117 has been gradually retired. Though a breakthrough in aviation and military technology, it was not exactly the greatest plane in the world. It was furiously expensive. So expensive, in fact, Reagan attempted to offset costs by making it a joint venture with the Brits. If they paid for it, mm. they said no. It was a maintenance nightmare. They were costly to run. They broke down all the time. I mean, every pilot I've ever seen interviewed admitted it was rare that on long flights, everything would still be working by the time you landed, assuming it even had been when you took off. It also lacked warning systems. It didn't have a radar, countermeasures, or could even fight other planes. It couldn't even go supersonic. The Air Force needed it to be more. And with the age of advanced computing, it became easier to combine faceting with more aerodynamic shapes. The F-117 was replaced by the F-20 which could go supersonic, it could fight other planes, it had a radar, it had countermeasures, it had a warning system that could tell if it was being locked onto, it was more aerodynamically sound, and it had an RCS signature even smaller than an F-117. Oh, yeah, and so baby. the humble Nighthawk found itself outdated. And even yet, this is, in my opinion, still one of the most beautiful and striking mm. planes ever made. It is quite possibly the most groundbreaking plane ever made, and in every theatre it operated door. in, the stealth worked. And though Serbia shot one down, the Nighthawks continued to fly almost every other night. They never shot another one down. And believe you me, they tried. And though the plane is retired, keep in mind this was built in the 1970s, and in spite of all that time that has passed, no one has been able to replicate it. Russia tried and failed, China operates a modification of one of Russia's failed prototypes and claims it's stealthy, but they claim a lot of things. Britain got close with the P-125 and later the replica, both would never be built and the technology developed for them would eventually be recycled into the F-35 program. But all those prototypes did was prove the Brits got their maths right. It's a bit of a leap going from getting the math right to actually building it. The Su-57 is probably the best example of that. The computer models the Russians developed are probably telling them that this should be a very stealthy aircraft, but they just lack the expertise to follow through. Anamarki is doing a feature-length video on how they fucked up and why, so I'll defer to him. But the point is, every nation has, at some point, tried, and has been trying for near enough 40 years now. China, Russia, Turkey, Japan, Britain, France, and even Sweden have all attempted and they have all failed. They all failed to build what this one little team were able to achieve back in the 1970s. But more important than that, there is one final chapter to this aircraft. Really? This is the F-104 Starfighter. <laughs> I did say we'd get to it. Uh, this is one of the worst planes ever made by man. Yeah. In my opinion. Mm -hmm. It's the single plane I hate the most. It was designed to offer the world a lightweight, low-technology fighter to compete against the likes of the MiG-15 and MiG-17. It was an all-weather aircraft and the first production aircraft to break Mach 2. It was built on the experience of fighter pilots in Korea and was the end result of thousands of hours of comprehensive study and development of wing and fuselage designs and testing, and as a result, it offered something no other jet in the world could. It could climb faster than any other aircraft, fly faster than any other aircraft, and fly higher than any other aircraft, and it could perform equally at both high and low altitudes. It was an absolute record breaker. But it had one major problem. Its landing speed was also its stall speed. Because of its tiny stubby wings, if the plane moved too slowly, it would simply not generate the lift required to remain airborne and would drop like a stone. Recovery in a stall was almost impossible, which led to a high rate of casualties for the pilots, as bringing this thing into land required a great deal of skill and concentration. The German Luftwaffe would suffer the highest casualty rate, losing 160 
15 of its pilots to crashed landings. But that wasn't the worst of it. You see, so successful was this aircraft that it basically became Europe's jet fighter. And being that every European country now had a high performance, low cost jet fighter that could rival the very best of Soviet designs, there was no need for a lot of the European designs that were being prototyped. So things like the SR-53, a British fighter jet that was half rocket engine, or the VJ-101, a German Mach 2 capable VTOL aircraft, mm -hmm. as well as a VTOL transport, the DO-31, were cancelled. And worst of it was that the F-104 didn't replace all of those by its own merit. While fast, it was about as manoeuvrable as a drunk cow behind the wheel of a Renault Twingo. It was a fairly mediocre fighter and the US mothballed it pretty quickly. But the reason it became Europe's jet fighter of choice was that Lockheed actually managed to secure all those contracts for foreign service of the F-104 by paying huge bribes to various political officials across Europe. It was a ma- Oh yeah, there were lots- yeah, Lockheed was getting bribed. Hell, in Japan, where this thing was- when this thing was brought in to be basically Japan's next fighter, the Yakuza were involved! I'm not joking, I wish I was! But yeah, the Yakuza, Japan's premier criminal organization, basically worked with Lockheed and the Japanese government accepted bribes and got and made this. The Yakuza, I mean, when the fuck, when you have a fucking criminal organization basically advocating for your aircraft, that's not really a good highlight. What a problem aircraft. This is the, this is the problem child. Yeah. Massive political scandal oh, and already yeah. taking a beating with the failure of the TriStar commercial jet, mm -hmm. Lockheed were now about two billion in the red. They had recently been bought out by the Textron Corporation, who were in the process of oh. selling off Lockheed's assets and had plans to strip the company down for anything valuable before writing it off as a tax break. This was around the time that Skunk Works heard about that stealth plane contract. The F-117 was a risk. It was not only the first truth stealth jet, it was the jet that saved Lockheed as a company. Without it, they and Skunk Works simply wouldn't exist, and many of the projects that have come out of it in recent years probably wouldn't have existed either. And that's why, to me, this will always be my favourite plane. The Nighthawk may now only exist in museums, some still do fly to simulate enemy stealth planes and training missions, but it's kind of weird to know that this aged, outdated, this and remarkably beautiful, almost piece of art has yet to be surpassed by anyone who's tried. Also because it looks sick as fuck. Absolutely. There, I used a modern term. Do kids still say that? Do kids still say that? No, but I, I don't, don't care know. what they think. But now I'm cool. Yes you are, pig. Yes you are. Okay, so this is just a quick post-production addendum to try and oh. curtail some of the comments that I'm probably going to get. Now, uh -oh. okay, I know there's some basic stuff. This is actually called a gannet, not a garnet. I don't know why I said garnet, but you know, I, I can be a bit silly sometimes. Also, I think most people would agree that the most iconic American aircraft carrier is probably the Nimitz, not the Forrestal. But, yeah. You know, whatever. I actually want to touch on this thing, the S-400 system not being able to detect the F-35 and similar stealth planes because it operates in the principle of what they think works versus what actually actually works. Now, every time I say literally anything on Russian technology, I get about a billion comments from sudden experts in Russian weapons, all of whom have these very generic profiles, terrible grammar, and operate exclusively between the hours of 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. Moscow Standard Time. So to explain, the S-400 system is the missile system, not the radar. The stealth-beating radar it comes attached to is called the Nebo-M. This is three different radar systems that operate in conjunction with each other, the main anti-stealth one being something called Long Wavelength Radar, which typically operates in the VHF band. Radar has different bandwidths, okay? It's yeah. complicated, I'm not going to get into it. So VHF radar, this is the herd my Second World War radar that the bullshit parade like to talk about. It's huge, okay? It looks like this. It's an absolutely massive array. God it damn. requires huge amounts of power, but it can detect stealth planes because things like radar absorbing material and faceting do have a limited effect on stuff like this. But here's the problem. Well, all that's fine in principle. You can see, yes, my World War II radar can detect stealth planes. What that radar cannot do is give you a clear picture of what it is it's looking at, where it is, how fast it's going, how high 
high up it is. It cannot say, for example, provide targeting information to a missile. It can so only they, say, so yes, say, yes, something yeah, is there. vaguely in that direction somewhere. It's if this is the kind somewhere. of system you're going to run, you've got three options when it pings something. Now, the first is to fire a big missile into that vague area, which could be anything from five to 200 square miles, and hope that the missile's onboard targeting system see something and locks onto it, which, which is not going to happen, okay? Option two, you send a squadron of planes to go have a look and hope that they can deal with the situation when it arises. Or, you know, they're dead. So what Russia does is option three. It sets up a bunch of other radar systems, all operating in different frequencies, and uses those to try and triangulate something that narrows down the search area, which is all done by things like Doppler radars, which have their own weaknesses, or things like the Casta 2E, which is the radar system that, that Russia's hyping up as the big anti-stealth radar, which is, it's literally just a regular radar system, which operates in low frequency mode, typically in the L and X band, which again, has difficulty yeah. providing targeting information to a missile system and has never been proven to work. You also have the problem that low frequency high powered radar systems like this generate a lot of noise. They are very easy to detect. So if what you're pinging with it has anti-radiation missiles or an electronic warfare package, for example, if it's an F-35, then you can't get an accurate picture of what they are, but they now know exactly where you are and they have all the targeting data they need. That mass- How much you want to bet? that stealth pilots will probably use that to their advantage. Like they're just, they'll just be like, send them some F-35 with some anti-radar missiles. And then they just, and then they just said, they're like, oh, the Russians have spotted us. Oh, are they doing it? Yep, I've got a clear picture. Launch everything. They're gonna, we're gonna hit something. All those missiles will just wipe out their entire air system. All right, they're clear. Send in the F-15s with all the bombs of God. <laughs> Massive radar system has a couple of minutes left to live at best. You're gonna have, as soon as you ping something, once you know where it is, you gotta pack that thing up, you gotta move as fast as possible. And that ain't easy when your radar system's that size, trust yeah. me. The system works in principle, but the reality might be a little bit different. Russia has never faced stealth jets. It has never built a working stealth jet to test these systems on. It has never been able to prove that such a system works. And given Russia's track record on its claims of military prowess, I'd be hard pushed to believe anything they say. Now that said, there is no such thing as perfect stealth. A regular radar system will detect a stealth plane within a certain range. That, that's just inevitable, okay? But that range is typically very short, a lot shorter than what most people think. Oh, yeah. And this means there can be hidden gaps in enemy <laughs> air defenses. Modern assessments have estimated, based on information the US has about the S-400 system, because it has allies which do operate it and do know what it's capable of, have said you could get a target lock on an F-35 if the aircraft is flying within 20 miles of the radar, and the pilot is the biggest dumbass on the planet and ignoring all the warnings that the plane is giving off that it's being spotted by a radar system, which is something that even older generations of planes could do. 20 miles may seem a lot, but you need to understand the Russians claim the S-400 can detect stealth planes within 200 miles miles. So there's a bit of a discrepancy there. But stealth is less about not being detected and more about delaying that detection long enough that you can perform your mission and then get the hell out of there before- It's like a suppressor. Yes, it's not a silencer. Okay. A little rant here. Another little rant nearing in the last few seconds. Oh my god. But yes. So yes, final rant. Final rant of the night. Of the day. A silencer is wrong. You don't call things a silencer if you put it on a gun. It's not meant to silence the gunshot. It's meant to make it look sound like something else. That's not a gunshot. Same thing with stealth. It's not meant to totally camouflage and cloak the plane. It's meant to make the guys on the ground go, what's that? What is it? Um, uh, Try to clear it up. Try to clear it up. Uh, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. God, what the hell? What the, what the hell is this? Thing? Uh, oh, it's a plane. Oh, shit, it's a plane. Oh, shit, it's a that is what stealth is. It's meant to make the enemy keep guessing guessing what they got on their screen or or maybe not see something on their screen long enough to basically blow up. Sorry, banana. Don't worry. You know that you know you can watch this thing later. But yeah, so that is stealth. It's not meant to, to make the plane incredibly invisible. It's just meant to make to make it so undetectable long enough for it to drop a bomb on some bad guy.
or the enemy can react to it. One thing about the F-117 shootdown that the Serbs tend to forget about is that the F-117 in question had already destroyed its target, which was a command post. So even though the Nighthawk was shot down, the shootdown didn't really achieve anything. I mean, the target was still hit and was destroyed. Anyway, mm -hmm. I think that's everything, but uh, feel free to whine at me in the comments because I'm sure I've probably missed something. And you know what it's like? Uh, you missed out the thing you didn't talk about. No. Something, something, something. Oh no, it's a bird, it's a plane. Oh no, it's Lockheed Martin with an F-117, baby. I've already drawn you as the Sawyer boy. Whatever. Like, I'm sorry this took so long to get out. Um, Happy New Year, I guess. Uh, Thanks for watching. Bye, game subs. Gamer, gamer sup, gamer subs. It's called gamer sup. I drink it all. It's really nice. Okay. Get the guacamole gamer fart. It's the best flavor. <laughs> oh, alrighty then. Ah, oh, another excellent video by the pig. Oh, woo! That was fucking excellent. Ha! Huh. Wow. I reached over 60 people viewing. Thank you all for watching, and thank you, and thank you to the two people that did leave donations. Huh. Well, this video was incredible. It's good to watch another. It was good, and I didn't raise my blood pressure as I thought I would. He got the reformers out of the way real quick. That was excellent. But yes, ah, oh, another great video by Pig. <laughs> So, I hope you all enjoyed this, and yes, we have finally had justice for the F-111. Fuck yeah, my aardvark! But yes, so thank you all for watching. If you like this video, make sure you do hit the like and subscribe button, as well as the notifications. Support me on all my social media, and if you want to support my channel even more, keep giving Koa cookies, keep keeping the lights on, and keep me doing all this stuff for you lovely people. Honestly, the best way to do it is my little join button down there. That's the best way to support my channel. But anyway, with that, I think I will have to call it a night, a day, so thank you all for watching, and as always, you know who I am, I know who you are, I will see you all in the next video.